Romans chapter number 15, if you will. We continue our look verse by verse through the book of Romans. Uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback through uh, emails and so forth. People are enjoying our Ephesians studies. If you can't be with us on Wednesday, you can still see the Ephesians studies on YouTube, NorCal Grace. So make sure you take advantage because they kind of fit hand in hand. Um, it, Romans is the foundation, but Ephesians takes us into the heavenly places. Ephesians shows God's devotion to us as his members of his body, okay, as his vessel called the church today. But Romans, is, it shows us the fundamentals of the faith. And in Romans chapter 15, again, Paul, he, we're, we're, we're almost towards the end. Paul wants the, the grace of God, the grace that we received of God and built up through Pauline doctrine. He wants that to operate out through us. Uh, that's what we're seeing here in Romans 15. It's the righteousness of God, the grace of God, uh, working out through us as saints one toward another. Uh, look at Romans chapter number 15. And uh, we left off in verse 7, but I'm just going to read down from 1 to 7, just so you can get the gist of it. We've expounded on these in other studies. Verse 1. We then that are strong, that's strong in faith, in the faith, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and that's him that is weak in the faith, chapter 14, 1, and not to please ourselves. The, the goal of the, of, the, of, the, of the strong in faith ought to be to look for those who are weak in faith and help edify them. Verse 2, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. So you look at, for ways that, by the way, it's not always just giving them the doctrine. You may not be as good as giving the doctrine out as someone else, but you can, you can through your prayers, through your giving, through other means, time, treasure, talent, this is good for the edification of others. I, I mentioned our YouTube ministry and our website and other uh, types of um, outreach, the, the blog, Sister Jan's blog, the Twitter, even the cards. All these are ways that we can edify people in the truth of God's grace. Well, verse 3, the reason we do this, our, our greatest example is the Lord himself. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Now, we saw all of that in a previous study, so we, we went through that. Verse 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our <coughs> learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We went over that, how Paul goes back and shows that those things from the book of Psalms, that was written to the nation of Israel, but we can have that spiritual application today. The issue of that glory that the Lord Jesus Christ understood he would receive as he endured Israel's sins and, 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 and upon himself. Well, we, as we deal with members of the body, we have that hope of glory as we, it's fruit that's abounding to our account. We went over that. Verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation, patience, enduring through the word of God, consolation, that comfort. He says he grants you, the believer today, to be like-minded. That's like-minded to the Lord Jesus. One toward another. How should we look at one another? As Christ would have us look at one another. He says, notice verse 5, according to or in line with Christ Jesus. How did the Lord operate it in Israel? He looked for those who were weaker and he blessed them. He went around doing good, blessing Israel. Now, we're going to see today that the Lord Jesus Christ, unlike popular... <coughs> teaching in Christendom today, he didn't just go about giving everybody miracle signs and wonders. It was a specific group of people that he blessed with miracle signs and wonders. We're going to see that. It was the Hebrews, the circumcision. Paul's going to get to that in a moment. Look at verse 6. That, here's the purpose, if you're like-minded, that ye may with one mind. Now what mind is that? The mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2. The mind of Christ is laid out in the Pauline epistles, Romans through Philemon, for you and me today. Most people, when they think about the mind of Christ in Christendom, they think, oh, the four Gospels. But that's not right. I heard a guy, I, I couldn't get any reception. The only station that came through, I was waiting for my singers yesterday, and I took them out. And it was some religious station. I was like, oh, okay, I'll listen to it. I, I hardly do that because I don't, and this goof was up there, and he says he was called in the ministry, and he read the Gospels over and over and over, and they're all in his heart and in his mind, and he's going to teach the Gospels. He built up doctrine, but it wasn't sound doctrine. It wasn't Pauline. And guess what his message was about? This right here. In fact, he, he took a passage, I believe, out of another section, either Paul or it was out of the book of Acts. 
He was talking about Acts 1, 8, you shall be due with power from on high. And instead of explaining about the kingdom, uh, the establishing of the earth and kingdom and so forth, he took that little bit and ran with it and showed how God gives us the power to do all this. He didn't even teach the passage. <laughs> Why? Wow, because he was all up in the Gospels. And it, but if he really was in the Gospels, he would explain the earthly kingdom. So all it does is frustrate me when I listen to these guys don't rightly divide. Sorry, okay? It just frustrates me. Well, notice here. The one mind is the truth of God's word today. Verse number six. That ye, that's the members of the body, may with one mind, the mind of Christ, not the Gospels. It's good to know those things supplementary, but the mind of Christ today is found in Paul's epistles. And one mouth. Not just what you think about, but what you speak. See, that guy says, I read the gospel, they were calling me, and blah, blah, blah. And he was speaking that. Desiring to be teachers of the law, that's the law. Understanding neither what they say, nor where they affirm. First, uh, First Timothy. That was this guy that I listened to. That wasn't the one mouth that glorifies God today. The one mouth that glorifies God, the one speaking is this message of grace. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you know how to answer every man. We're to answer every man with the gospel of grace, the answers from God's grace. That's what he's talking about. Look at verse 6. That ye may with one mind and one mind. By the way, when Paul says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, you probably first thing talking about cursing and stuff like that. And yes, it's that. But it's not just that. In fact, I can tell you, he's more reading Ephesians and Colossians. Let your speech be always with grace. That's what he means when he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. He's not talking about curse words. He's talking about don't let unsound doctrine proceed out of your mouth. He wants that doctrine to be grace message. If somebody asks you a question about something, you have to give them what Paul has to say about it or the rightly divided word. That's what he means by one mouth. Verse 6. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify or give thanks to who? God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ has a God and Father. That's the ultimate person in charge. That's God the Father. Look at verse 7. Wherefore, here, here's the summation of it all. Receive ye. Remember chapter 14, he says, him that is weak in this faith, receive ye. To receive means to bring them into your bosom, as it were. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received who? Us, to the glory of God. Now, watch what Paul does here. In this Roman church, there are both Jews and Gentiles. That's, that's who makes up the Roman church. Paul would quote to those that know the law, the Jews like him who got saved into the body. And obviously at Rome, that church is filled with Gentiles as well. So you got two collections of people. Now we're going to look at that in Ephesians. When Paul talks about Jesus Christ and quotes the Old Testament, those Jews in the body can say, yep, that saw him this, that saw him that. The Gentiles who, who weren't privy to the Old Testament, they had not the law. They would just look at this and say, okay, we get that. So in both categories, the Jews could say, yes, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Messiah, he was, he, he was rejected by our people, and yet he died for them, their sins of, of that old covenant. Then those Gentiles could say, I understand, we were far off from God, and he received us. So in, whether you're a Jew in the body like Paul, who understood the Old Testament program, or whether you wanted these heathen Gentiles who got saved by Paul's gospel, you're in the body and Christ received us. That's why he goes and look at verse 8. Now I say, this is Pauline, that Jesus Christ was, past tense by the way, don't miss that. That's right. Jesus Christ is no longer in this dispensation of grace a minister of the circumcision. That's, that's in reference to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Got to rightly divide. Hold your hand here and go to 2 Corinthians 5. At Corinth, there were Jews in the body like, like Paul was, just like at, at Romans. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. If you don't understand that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the, particularly the Lord's, the reason why the Gospels, the four Gospels, the three synoptic and John, because they can see the difference, John is futuristic. 
The reason why those four presentations of Christ are so important to Christendom is because the Lord Jesus Christ is in the flesh. His words, you see him. He's incarnate. Jesus is God incarnate. So everybody focus on that. He got the red letters and everything. It's, it's oh, the Lord. Like the guy said, I just, the gospels were calling me. No, they weren't. <coughs> they were, well, he probably was because he had a carnal mind. Today, what ought to call you is the gospel of grace. But let me show you something. The reason why this is so important, notice in verse 16, chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. There were Jews like Paul who got saved into the body of Christ who truly understood what was going on back there. Verse 16, wherefore, henceforth, from this moment on, know we no man after the flesh. Now, if you don't know anything about Paul's ministry in 2 Corinthians, the Corinthians were looking for a human viewpoint, human wisdom, religious wisdom. They looked at man after the outward appearance. Paul didn't look like an apostle. He didn't talk like an apostle in their minds. He didn't, he, didn't, he, he didn't have the right stature. He didn't have his three-piece suit, his robes. Were, he didn't have all the trappings of religion. And they said, that guy cannot be God's man then. He always had to endure uh, doubt of his apostleship Okay, in the Corinthian epistles. Well, Paul says, uh, dummies, excuse me, foolishness. He goes, what are you judging after the outward flesh for? What are you looking at that? Look at what's coming out of my, my mouth. Is it truth? Verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known who after the flesh? Right. Christ. Messiah, Christ after the flesh. And what he's talking about, there was this time recently in Paul's, in, in, in their lifetime where Jesus Christ did walk in the flesh. And it's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in early Acts. Acts 1, before his ascension. But notice what he says. Yet now. Henceforth, from this moment on, particularly the dispensation of grace, know we him no more. Now, that doesn't mean you don't know Christ. We're to know Christ that I might know him. But when he says, now, henceforth, know we him no more, that's not how we know the Lord Jesus Christ after the earthly ministry, the flesh, when he was in flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, but he didn't stay there. His last words wasn't the red letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. His last words came as he came down met Paul, Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, Acts 9, and over 30 plus years gave him visions and revelations of the mystery of Christ. Jesus didn't end his speaking when he left the earth. He spoke again through his spokesman, his apostle Paul, to you and me. Amen. That's what, that's what God's word, that's how, how we know Christ today, the Messiah, the, the anointed one, the one who God has anointed to run all things. Okay? Go back, go back to uh, Romans 15. So Paul brings up this issue of the circumcision. Look at verse 8. Now I say, when you, when you see that one from Paul, I say, he's given you some, some Pauline truth, that Jesus Christ was, past tense, a minister of the who? Circumcision. circumcision. For Here's why. For the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now today we're going to look at what it means, the circumcision. And what's up with this truth of God? Before we look at circumcision, look at the rest of verse 8. For the truth of God. Two. Now, is God true? Yes, he's truth. In body. He's the embodiment of truth. He's the fountain of truth, God. Yet God in his grace allows proof to humanity of his truth. Through confirming in time past through miracle signs and wonders. But the greatest proof to the, to the Hebrew people, and that's what the circumcision is, we're going to see that, about what God is going to do with them, ultimately to give them an earthly kingdom, is the fact that he sent his own son, Jesus Christ. The ultimate proof of God's truthfulness to Israel is that he sent his son. Isaiah says what? Unto us a child, a son is born. No, unto us a child is born son is and a son is given. See, that child that was born through Mary, that was the incar in flesh, incarnate, in flesh, God incarnate in the flesh. But he didn't exist, excuse me, he didn't just, he didn't come into existence at the conception. He always existed from everlasting, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So that's why he didn't just say a child is born unto us, Israel, a child is born, 
Mary's baby Jesus, a, a son was given. Whose son was it? God's son. Proverbs says, do you know the Lord? Do you know his son? Kiss the son. The Jews claim, oh, God has no sons. The Muslims say God has no son. The Bible says God has a son. Amen. And that son is, is Jesus Christ. Jesus. Now watch this. Now I say that Jesus Christ, verse 8, was a minister of the circumcision. Why? For the truth of God. His, his, his three and a half year ministry, really short as far as ministry, but it was powerful testimony of the truth of God to the Hebrew people. I'm going to show you that. That's, that's a Hebrew, Abram and the Hebrew, and that's where circumcision comes from. Hold on. To confirm the what? Promises made unto the fathers. That's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then in all these Jewish ancestors of that day. David, the Davidic covenant. Okay? Now, what's up with this promises? Go to chapter 9 of Romans. We already saw some of this. Look at Romans chapter number 9. When we talk about God, you ever heard somebody use the term Jehovah? By the way, if you're dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, just kind of condescend them in a lower state and use the term Jehovah, okay? That's fine, because that's how they, it, 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 it's a stumbling block if you don't say Jehovah, but that's fine. J Jesus' name is Jehovah is salvation. That's his name, earthly. What was his name before he became a man? In the beginning was... The word, it's the word. That's right. His name was the word. There's three that bear within witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and, 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 and the Spirit. These three. Before he became Jesus, Jehovah is salvation. Before he created man, and man need, didn't need salvation, Jehovah became salvation. That's what Jesus means, Joshua. His name before, in, in his existence, his name, he's the Word of God. The Word, okay? Now watch this. But he became Jesus. And he became Jehovah. You know who Jehovah was? That's Israel's. That's Israel's God, the Hebrews, the God of Israel, the God of Hebrews. That's how he related. All those Jehovah, Brother Matthew has a wonderful uh, um, job of breaking down all those Jehovah's names, you know, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nis, and all these Jehovah names. Jehovah Jireh, Abraham in, in Genesis 22, right? God the provider, Jehovah Rapha, God is our healer. Jehovah. That's, it's a, yeah, exactly. He, it was seven of them, compound names. That represents how God is, is, is manifest to the Hebrew people. What happened when Moses was at the mount and says, they're going to ask me who sent me. He says, no, he, first he says, who are you? He says, I am that I am. He said, I am what? I am. I'm the ever existing one. I am that I am. I am that I am. The one I've been telling him about since Abraham. Then when he says, what should, what, what should I tell him? He says, tell him, I am I sent you. you. I mean, think about that. What he's saying? He said, I am whatever you need me to be. And he goes to show them throughout that, that he is their provider and their healer and all these things. Okay? So it's a lot. But understand, that's how he presents himself to the Hebrew people. Okay? The circumcision. Okay? Watch this. Look at Romans 9. When Paul looks at history, he sees the Jewish people, his people. Verse number three, Romans 9, 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are what? Israelites. There's a nation. Well, when you think about Israelites from a biblical perspective, the nation of Israel, the people of the nation of Israel, to whom pertaineth the adoption, that's the adoption of sons in the, in the earthly kingdom, and the glory, God's going to bear his glory in, in, in the earth through that people, and the covenants, all those covenants, we're going to see in Ephesians in a moment. And the giving of the law. God didn't give the law to him. Psalm 147, verse 19 and 20, I think. He showeth his word unto Israel and his law unto Jacob. He hath not done so with any nation. Praise ye the Lord. He was praising the Lord and he didn't give it. The Gentiles which have not the law, Paul says. That's, that, that's what he's talking about. By the way, the law was a covenant. But because it was a temporary covenant, Paul separates it here. We know it's a covenant. It says in the Old Testament, Paul says in Galatians. But it was temporary. Why? Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I should make a new covenant. Jeremiah 36, Ezekiel 37, and so forth. Jesus shed his blood as that testator. The, the blood of the bulls and goats sprinkled on the law and the people was a testator. And then in types and shadows for that 1,500 years or whatever before the Lord came. Okay? 
Now watch this. When you come to the Lord, verse number four, who are Israelites to whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God, who's going to be the priest of God in the future? Israel. Israel. G G the Lord's the high priest and they, they, they serve as priests uh, to the Gentiles in the kingdom. Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. I think we might get to Ezekiel today too. But anyway, you're going to see that millennial temple there. And they're doing the service, the priestly service. A priest is a go-between between between God and man. Now, you don't need a priest today. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You get into Christ by trusting the gospel of grace that he died for your sins, that he shed his blood for your sins. We don't need a priest today. But in, in, in the prophecy, the Gentiles do need a priest. We're going to see that. Israel, Revelation says, Revelation 5, verse 10, so forth. Or 10, verse 5, okay, but... It says, we shall be kings and priests and reign with him where? On the earth. Israel, by the way, the name Israel, when he changed Jacob's name to Israel, back here, he says, as a prince, thou hast had favor with God and man. Canaan is the land of the priest. So they will be kings and priests in a land. Moses says, uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Well, write it right here. You be a peculiar people to, unto me, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and what type of nation? Holy nation. Holy nation. That's why Peter comes along later and says to Israel about here, he says, a royal, a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Mm -hmm. Peter's just consistent with what Moses said. And what we talk about these churches, you got the Mosaic church, then you have the that goes right here to John the Baptist, the law of the prophecy. Then you got the Messianic church out here. You got the church in the wilderness. You got the Messianic church. It's all pointing to this Messianic kingdom church that's going to be fulfilled in prophecy on the earth. But there's another church, one that nobody knew about. The church which is his body. We see in that in Ephesians. That church, that mystery church, is not going to be on this earth. We're going to be taken into where we were created to serve the Lord, the service of God on the heavenly places. But that messianic kingdom, they're going to be down here, okay? That's what he means, the service of God and the promises. Verse 5, who are, whose are the fathers? So those fathers Paul is talking about there in Romans 15, speaking of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth. The promises, whose are the fathers? And of whom as concerning the what? Flesh. Flesh. Remember when he says in 2 Corinthians 5, though we have known Christ after the flesh, man, the greatest proof of Almighty God is the fact that God came and dwelt in the flesh of a, of a Jew, of a Hebrew, of an Israelite. His name was Jesus. There we go. Verse 5, whose are the fathers and who concerning the flesh? Christ came. Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah, who is, speaking of the Lord, Jesus Christ, who is over all, by the way, there's that definition of Christ. He's over all God blessed. The God the Father blessed how long? Forever. Forever. And the saints say, Amen. 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 It is so. <laughs> so the greatest proof of God's truth to the Hebrew people, to the circumcision, go back to Romans 15. If, if you want to show somebody that God is real, well, the Bible shows prophecy. Isaiah 42, Isaiah, uh, I'll tell you him from the beginning. That's why the Quran is not it, no other book, because the only book that shows the beginning, the end from the beginning that has fulfilled prophecies is the Bible. And not only that, the person that it's all pointing to is who? Christ. Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, he tells those Pharisees, John, in John. But they are those which testify of who? Me. Me. Paul says, even the righteousness, he talks about, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of who? <coughs> Jesus Christ. He's the one that the law and the prophets spoke about. You remember in the book of John where Philip sees him and Nathaniel, he says, I'm going to show Nathaniel, my brothers, I got to tell him. He going to say, he said to Nathaniel, here's the one whom Moses and the prophets spoke about, <coughs> Jesus. How did they get it? Because they had, remember Wednesday, you need a soft heart? Those who had soft hearts to believe God's word, that the, 
It's frustrating. It's frustrating. God promised the seed of the woman back in Genesis 3, 15. The hope of a Hebrew woman was to get married and have a son because you know why? Maybe that son would be who? Jesus. The Messiah, right? Yeah. That's why it was such a crushing blow when those women in the Old Testament, go read, when they couldn't have a child. It was I mean, they... It wasn't like the women in Israel want to have a baby and want somebody to love and dress up. No, and love me. No, it was so that maybe my son would be Messiah. Why do you think they put a premium on boys? Right. Not because they didn't want gir like girls. It was that the Messiah was going to come. He's going to be a man. When Eve lost her young son, oh, he was a man then. When, when she lost her son by the hand of her other son, when Cain killed her baby Abel, her baby boy, Abel, you all was a baby. I'm 40 years old, my mother, I'm still her baby boy. When she lost her, he was an adult son, but he was her, her boy by her other boy. She has another child. What was the name of her other child? You remember? Seth. We had Seth. Now, hold your hand here. Let me show you something I see here. And... Go back to Genesis chapter number three. Genesis three. The reason it's important is when, when Nathaniel says, when Philip says to his brother Nathaniel, that they were brothers, so they had the same view on this, it's, it's apparent. Hey, this is the guy that Moses and the prophets have been talking about. He could have just said, This is the guy that Mo by the way, when he says Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses did. This guy is not just going back to the law. He's going way back to the beginning, Genesis 3.15. Adam and Eve were looking for this deliverer, this Messiah. They were. You could tell by, look at um, chapter 4. Exactly. Look at Genesis chapter 4. That's what it is. Check this out. They were looking for this guy. I'm about to, the people are going to think I'm crazy. They were looking for this one. Since the judgment, since, since the judgment, the, when, when Eve and Adam watched God judge the serpent and say, the, the seed of the woman shall destroy the seed, your seed, serpent seed. Okay, now watch this. Verse number one, Genesis four. And Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare who? Cain. Who came up? Cain. And said... I have gotten a man from the Lord. She's thinking back to Genesis she, she's, 3. She's 13. I'm about to just she's sit down and let her think back to Genesis Yes, 13. that's what she's right thinking. There ain't no other women. I have gotten a man from the Lord. She's not just saying, hey, I got a man. She's saying, this, he's, the he's the one. Now, was Cain the one? Nope. No. So, process of time, then his brother Abel is, is born, obviously, right there in verse 2. They become grown men, and then Cain kills Abel. So now that Abel is dead, watch when she conceives again to Seth. Yep. Go down to verse number. Uh, oh, that's oh, boy. Where, where? Is it 25? Yes, thank you guys. Verse number 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, She. Now, wait a minute. Now she, first, first of all, she was focused on herself. I have gotten a man from the Lord. Watch what she says here. She got it. For God said she hath appointed me another seed yes. instead of Abel. Okay. What, it's, it's a nuance, but she, at first she was like, oh, yeah, it was like, hey, I, 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 the issue is about me. I have gotten a man. But she realized, no, 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 no. It's not about me having this baby. It's about what God is doing. Notice in verse 25. For God said she. See, she got it. She started off by saying, I got a man from the Lord. Here she goes, you know what? God's the issue. For God <clears throat> has appointed me another seed instead of Abel. And the issue of appointed, she gets, she gets it now. She gets it now. That Eve, yes, you're the mother of all of Eve, you're not the issue. What I'm doing in the earth is the issue. Right. And, and, and when, when Philip says that, the one that Mo, uh, Moses and the prophets have spoken about, going all the way back to Genesis all through, the whole entire Old Testament scripture pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so if you were a Jew, you can know all that stuff about the Old Testament. But if, none, if, that, if that law wasn't a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ, if all that stuff that you know doesn't bring you to Christ, it's futile in the mind of God. Because it's not about you, it's about who? Him. And can I tell you, the greatest tr proof of the truth of Almighty God to what we're going to see as a circumcision is the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. You get that? Go back to uh, Romans 15. Let me show you that. Good, we're halfway through. The rest are going to... Not everybody's familiar with this issue of circumcision, so we're going to look at it. Look at Romans 15, verse 8. So we've seen that the greatest proof of God's trustworthiness is the Lord. By the way, who is the, who is the testator of that new covenant? Who's going to be the one who forgives their sins? Not just remit them where they can come back, but forgives them. Who's going to give them one, be the one to give them perfect righteousness? Who's going, to, who's going to be the one to give them the power to become sons of God? Christ. The Lord Jesus, yeah. The new covenant to be fulfilled through his, test, his yeah. death. Bam. Okay, now watch this. Now, what is this circumcision? Verse 8. Now, I say that Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision. Go with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter number 2. The circumcision was a way in Paul's day to describe the Gentile nations, the nations outside of the Hebrew people or what we now know as the nation of Israel. 2, 14. Uh, two start at verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Not everyone is familiar with this. We'll talk about circumcision, the covenant, but I want to get it on record now with the time we have left. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Now, we're going through the book of Ephesians every Wednesday, so I'm going to go verse by verse and I'm going to deal in detail. But right now, we're just going to get a general sense of it. Chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, now I'm not going to go through all the doctrine before you got to be with us on our study or see it on YouTube. Wherefore, remember. So Paul's going to remind the saints, these Gentiles in the body at, court, at uh, Ephesus, that ye, it's the saints, being in time past, that was the, before the dispensation of grace, Gentiles, how? In the, flesh. in the flesh. Now, Gentiles and nations are used synonymously in the scriptures. The Lord says to the little flock, after all these things do the nations of the world seek. And then another passage, the, the Gentiles. The Gentiles are the particular people that populate the other nations. You can have other nations, landmass, uttermost parts of the earth, and not have people in it. Okay? So the, the nations outside of the nation of Israel are the nations, but the people who populate it are the Gentiles. In fact, back, Genesis 10, the Gentile nations, okay? All right. These people in the body who are now saved, if they remember how God dealt with them in time past for a dispensation of grace, they were Gentiles. Now watch this. In the what? In their flesh. Well, how are you a Gentile in your flesh? Well, keep reading. Who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now who is that? In the old time, in Paul's day, the world was made up of Jews and Gentiles. To this day, Jews call us Gentiles or the Goyim, you know, Gentiles or non-Jews. They look at themselves as God's people. We're Jews, you're not, so you're Gentiles, you're non-Jews. I heard a Messianic Jew say that on his program. For you Jews and non-Jews. Yeah, it's like, oh, we're less than you, huh? In time past, we were. And there was this enmity where they got name calling. The Gentiles didn't understand circumcision. Like, who in the world would go down there with a knife and cut their flesh? That's crazy. That's how the Gentiles looked at Israel and said, the circumcision. They didn't say it with, with uh, they said it derogatory. Well, you know what the Hebrews said. They said, well, wait a minute, we're the people of God. He told us to do that. If you don't have your flesh circumcised, man, you're just a heathen, unclean Gentile dog. And so they said, you're the uncircumcised, right? Watch this. Go with me to 1 Samuel 17. You're going to see it. Everybody know David and Goliath. Did Moses' wife have a problem with circumcision? She did. She did. Being a Gentile. Thank you, Len. Thank you for... And if you don't know the story, <laughs> as Moses is out there in the wilderness, his wife's a poor Gentile. OK, 
Okay, you see Aaron and, and, and Miriam had a problem with it and all that and so forth. That's how Miriam got the leprosy. Just, anyway, she says, it, it says in the text that God was about to destroy Moses. His wife intervened, grabbed the little child, uh, what was his name? Uh, Gershom, right? And cut the little foreskin of his flesh, threw it at it, her husband's feet and go, you're a bloody husband unto me. She didn't understand, but she stepped in and saved her husband's life. Read that passage. We'll, we'll find it in the Q&A. Because God's going to destroy him all because of circumcision. Thank you for that. I only said it just for that. No, no, that's fantastic. That's, read that account. Uh, that's how important it is. Maybe we'll find it and put it on here. Thank you, Leonard. That was, I was thinking of a bunch of them, but that's a very important one. The, the, the greatest man in Israel's history before the Lord, Moses, or before John shows up, the greatest prophet, guess what? God was about to destroy him because he didn't keep the circumcision with his own son. His wife, who didn't understand the Gentile woman, cut it off and said, you're a bloody husband. <laughs> That's a lot of craziness in that. But I want you to show you something down the road from Moses down to David. I'm going to use David and Goliath because every, almost everybody heard the story of David and Goliath, how he killed the giant and so forth, and, and was going to do brothers too. But go to 1 Samuel 17. Let me show you something about this issue of circumcision, uncircumcision. 1 Samuel 17. Look at verse 26 and 36. Just to give you a sense, you can read it on your own. This is the, 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 the account where David kills Goliath. Type of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back and slaying the Antichrist. David cuts his head off. It's going to happen to Antichrist. Antichrist is out here beheading the martyrs of Jesus, these Jews in the little flock. And the Lord's going to give him some payback and his, take his head off. Well, David was a picture that he'd already killed Goliath. He went and took his head and cut it off. Showed everybody. Okay? Now watch this. 1 Samuel 17, David and Goliath, look at verse 26. David, here's old great Saul, king of Israel, head and shoulders above the rest. He has this great army. Saul has killed his thousand, David says, tens of thousands, the women of Israel would lament. Well, old Saul was such a wimp and his army, because there's Goliath, his brothers, and the Philistine army, and they're just each day looking at each other, and the Israel army did nothing. Here comes the eighth son of Jesse, young David, who was so small in stature, and, and, and nobody thought much about him as that little shepherd boy, that when Samuel the prophet came to anoint him, old Jesse brings all his seven sons, and he says, God says, none of these guys. Is that all? They, had, they forgot about David. They didn't even think about the young man. God says, that's the one. Here's old little David. He sees this thing going on day after day and says, what in the world is going on over here? Well, it's just a stalemate. And David says, uh, Saul, you do realize who we are and who they are, don't you? Watch this. Verse 26. I mean, that's what's going on. Verse 25, just to, uh, verse 24 to get the, the, the thing. Here's, here's Goliath. All right. Verse 23. No, y'all understand. <laughs> and as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion. I love, look how they call Goliath the champion. He was a warrior, man, the ultimate warrior, the ultimate warrior. There was a wrestler called the ultimate warrior, Jack. The Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Here's Saul, he mocking Israel, and David now hears this. Now watch what happens. And all the men, men of Israel, when they saw the man, they ran up to him one accord and said, We can destroy him in the name of the Lord. <laughs> no. When they saw the man, one man fled from him and were so afraid. I, you all understand, we're not just talking about regular men, we're talking about the armies of Israel. Their armed forces is out there and they run and so afraid from one man. He was a giant. He was all spring of the, the, the come down from those Nephilim. Nephilim. But still, he was a man. And, and more than that, he was flesh and blood. But more than that, he wasn't part of God's plan and purpose in Israel. Well, he was. He was going to be symbolic of the, the destruction of the Antichrist. But he played his part. Here we go. Verse number 25. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that's come up? Look how big he is. Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the, men who, the man who killeth him, the king, 
saw by Saul. We'll enrich him with great riches and we'll give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Um, David ended up getting Michael, Saul's daughter. She wasn't a good wife. David's worshiping the Lord. She's all, uh, she was one of these women want to run, run, his, run her husband. And David banished her, banished her out of his good graces. He ends up with Saul's daughter after he does this, makes his father's house free in Israel. That means no uh, taxation and so forth, no tribute, no, you, he was, he was exempt from paying money into Israel's treasuries as uh, unlike the other Jews, but paying into the, when he says house free. Verse 26, and David spake to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done? Now watch David, he gets it. What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? Now, 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 David is not saying this for his own gain. David is saying this for one reason, because there's a man who's sitting there and defying the, the, the living God of Israel. Amen. That's why he's doing it. Amen. David is not doing this for personal gain. He's saying, who, who is defying our God and why are you guys letting him do this? Watch this. For who is this what? Uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. You get that? Mm -hmm. David got it. He says, who is, by the way, who is this? David understood where did the power lie? We're going to see it. It has to be in the circumcision. Right. Okay? Look at verse 36. <clears throat> Thy servant slew both the lion. By the way, David has such confidence because did you know that God showed himself strong through David? As David's out there tending the sheep, type of him being the great shepherd, the Lord, tending the little flock. Who would come out to get the sheep? Well, lions would come and bears would come. By the way, lions represent these kingdoms of these Gentiles. You see it in Daniel, wow. bears, powers. Yes, exactly. And you know what little David did of the power of God? He was able to kill lions and bears that tried to attack his sheep. See, it's symbolic. Here we go. Thy servant slew both the lion, by the way, the lion, and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. How did David have such confidence, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God? What, what I want you to see is, as opposed to that dead god Dagon of the Philistine, that little fish god, and all the other Baal worship deities they had, God, David says, hey, the prophet says, in order for their gods to be clean, you got to pick them up and dust them off. We have a living God who through the power of that circumcision covenant he made with our father, we're about to look at. And you know what happened with David. You can read the rest. He destroyed. He killed Goliath. He picked up five stones going to kill his brothers as well. And he cut them off, and then all the Philistines ran and so forth. And David got the, the victory, okay, for Israel, for Israel, for God. By the way, God did it because David held up the, 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 the honor of the God of Israel. Yeah. Amen. And can I tell you, when we do things today, it's going to be hard at times, but think about something. When we defend the Pauline grace message, the mystery today, you don't think God has that same power or more now, the resurrection of Christ, at work in us? Spiritual, spiritually speaking, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not going to out there kill people. There are religions out there, Catholicism, Islam, Catholicism in the past, particularly Islam, where if, if they're going to conquer by the sword. If you don't believe their doctrine, they kill you. He doesn't tell us to do that. The one who's going to, the Lord, the righteous judge will take care of people. Okay. What he calls us to do is get out his grace message. Battle of the mind. It's, 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 it's not of the flesh, it's of the mind. It's a battle for hearts and minds, yours and others, right? We don't battle against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6, but against principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The prince of the power to air of the spirit which worketh now in the children of disobedience. Let me share this. We went to uh, Reno yesterday. I took my seniors. I normally don't work Saturdays, but sometimes they do. It was a two-hour drive. And everything. We went through this tunnel tour, Cal Neva. It's on the California-Nevada border. It's a hotel, Frank Sinatra, 
Marilyn Monroe, John F. Kennedy, all this. A bunch of gangsters, too. They had trap doors. They had uh, secret passageways. John F. Kennedy was said to go into Marilyn's, uh, Monroe's cabin there on, on Lake Tahoe through these secret passageways. Al Capone and these gangsters and Frank Sinatra owned the place and the FBI said, if we see one gangster, we're going to shut you down. And so, but, but he was funded by these gangsters, so they would hide in these places and watch the performance. It was crazy. But one of the things the tour guide kept saying was, every time people take pictures, they go and develop the pictures or see it, and there's these orbs, these orbs of light, and these, these things that look like ghosts and stuff. It's crazy. <laughs> the lights would go on and off. They bring in electricians. They say, we fixed it, and then we do it. They call it Maryland's light. People claim if you go in this tunnel, you see and you click, there's Maryland sitting there. They brought in, <laughs> they brought in uh, seances, uh, psychics, and a guy was speaking in some, t it's funny because he goes, he spoke in tongue. I told Chris, I go, every religion does, every, you know, this evil stuff. He bring in better, yeah. and, and he, they didn't know the language, so one guy says one of these Indian languages from Nevada, they took it back to the Indian chief, and he claimed that the Indian chief says, we know what that guy was saying, saying, you guy are on sacred ground, get out of here with this stuff. And I told Chris, I said, what they're seeing is all these angels of light, and these evil spirits, and these dark spirits, you could just feel the darkness down in there. It was a tunnel underground, but there was the spiritual wickedness there. And what they're doing, part of the, 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 the reason why they get so many people to come is because they play this up. They kind of allow the evil spirits, they come on evil spirits, we want y'all so that we can make some money. And evil spirits are fine with that. But I told Krista, that's spiritual wickedness. California, Nevada, all these regions there, just such spiritual wickedness. So this stuff is real. Now, they, they thought it was a joke, but that stuff is real. Playing around with that stuff. Say on it. <laughs> Calling the, the wicked spirits. I have no doubt that guy was speaking in something. That none of them knew that language. They go back and then the chief says, hey, this is what was said. No doubt. What did the spirit of God do? He'd speak in language people didn't know, and then somebody interpret that. It was positive, good, good doctrine. Well, evil spirits can do that too. So I told Krista, they don't know what they're playing around with. We saw pictures of these lights and stuff that would show up in darkness. I said, don't, 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 don't the devils, doesn't uh, Satan and these angels appear as angels of light? Amen. Yeah. See, this stuff is real. Lost people play around with it. Some do, some are serious. But when you allow this stuff, it's wickedness. That's the point. That's what's going on. So they're, they're withstanding. The, 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 the living God. Now watch this. Go with me back to go back to Romans. We got 15 minutes. Go back to Romans. Romans chapter 15. Oh, I was going to tell you about circumcision. Why did, why did David have such I took you guys to, I was telling you about that, that trip for a reason. I'm sorry about that. Maybe if I, if I didn't get to the point, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you during the Q&A. Just remind you. My, my point is, why did, why did uh, David have such confidence? Because of a circumcision. Now, if you're not familiar with physical circumcision, go back with me to Genesis 17. Let's, let's uh, pick up in Genesis 17. Do you need to tell why you were at that place? Why did I bring that? It was, it was going to be a great point. Sometimes you get that out. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's what, that's what, that's what it is. So, so I did. When we went there, that was one of the attractions of this underground tour, that the spirit of Marilyn and Frank Sinatra and all that. But does the audience know that that was a group that you take, you went there for? Oh yeah, I mentioned how I, I did that, I took my seniors there. Yeah. Um, I, was just let, I was letting my audience here know, you guys who listen to that, that spiritual wickedness, that stuff is real and alive today. Yes, it is. And there, I'm, I'm telling you, this place, this resort, Calneva Resort, is using that as an attraction. Come see the spirit. Now, by the way, it's not Marilyn's spirit there. If Marilyn's lost, her spirit is gone. It's going back to God. The gate. It's gone. Her soul is in hell. Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., all these guys who, John F. Kennedy, anybody who's lost it. But what are they saying? They're seeing evil, wicked spirits impersonating them, giving you what you want. That's the point, okay? But this stuff is real. Now, Genesis 17, physical circumcision is found here in this passage. 
Chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nigh. By the way, this is 13 years after he had Ishmael. If you look at chapter 16, the last verse, look at Genesis 16, 16. Look at verse 15 for the, for the paragraph. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare who? Ishmael. By the way, Ishmael is the, is the, is the father of uh, the, the Muslim religion, or that's what they take there. Abraham, Ishmael. Mm -hmm. Not Isaac. They still claim Abraham. Yes. But they go Abraham Ishmael, not Abraham Isaac, like the Hebrews, the Jews. Okay. Now watch this. Abraham, verse 16. And Abram was four score and six years. Now, four score and six years. You heard President Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago. That was 87 years. From the time he made that to the time of the founding father. Four score is how many? A score is 20. So four, 80, and six. So 86 years old was Abram when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Look at chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram. How many years between 86 and 99? 13. 13. Now, just look at it. Look, look how Moses writes it, writing the thing. It's apparent to me, in my thinking, because God would appear, that because of the rebellion of Abraham and his wife Sarah, he took her advice, bad advice. From 86 to, to 99, God didn't appear to Abraham, didn't talk to him. 13 in the Bible is the number of rebellion, Genesis and 13. 13, God allowed that rebellion to take its course, and then he appeared to Abraham again. It's the reason why one passage ends at 86 and another one's 99, and it says he appeared. That's how he would do. So what I'm showing you is that there was that period of rebellion of, because of Abraham doing what he did, now God is ready after that 13 years has been fulfilled. God does that with time. Fulfill, let, it, let, it, let it rise its course. He then does his thing. Now, watch verse 2. Start at verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make... Now, I want you to see this, okay? Now, we're going to pick up this next week because I don't want to miss this. And I will make... Whose covenant? My covenant. He didn't say our covenant, nor did he say your covenant. He says my covenant. <clears throat> One way. One way. Now it's going to be between me and thee. But I just want you to see the focus is what God's doing there. My covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. <clears throat> multiply your seed. Verse six, Verse 3. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. That's why he changed his name in this chapter, verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. That's what he means, father of many nations. Verse 6. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee. By the way, at this time, God... God Abraham and Sarah didn't have a child. Abraham's 99. Anybody know how old Sarah is at this time? If you remember. 80. 89. She's 10 years younger. Yeah. Watch this. Verse 6. And I will make... She, she, put in perspective, Dorothy. She's the age of Charlene. Yes. Be like Charlene, never having a child. Uh, she's past the childbearing years. Right. That's a miracle. Absolutely. Her body's now dead. And so was Abraham, that's what Romans 4. So we got, okay, let's keep going. And I will make thee, verse 6, exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee. By the way, nations. Not just the nation of Israel. Plural. Plural. You, you, got, you got, coming out of Abraham, you got all types of nations. He has Keturah and her ten sons after uh, Sarah did. Anyway, I will make nations of thee, and kings, plural, shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Oh, we. There it is. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. By the way, the biggest thing about any covenant God makes is he's to be your God. Oh, we got to end. Let, let me say this. We're going to pick this up next week right here. 
Even the new covenant. And I, the, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. He broke the pride of their power. Not according to the covenant that I made with them when I, when I brought them out of Egypt, held the hand the Mosaic, which covenant they break, although I was a husband. Behold, this will be the covenant that I make unto them. Then he goes through it. But then he says, and I will be their what? God. Can I tell you the main issue of these covenants is that he will be their God. That's where it starts. That's why when Paul says in Ephesians, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Well, we'll, we'll end in that passage. There's so much here. I, I, I thought I'd ever get it one. I won't. So next week, next Sunday, we're going to pick up in chapter 17. But I just want you to see this. Look at the end of verse 7. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Now, look at verse 8. I will give unto thee and thy seed the land, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their what? God. You see, he keeps saying, I will be their God. He's telling them what he's going to do, but the biggest thing is, I'm going to be their God. Now, verse 10, now I'm just, 10 and 11, then we're going to go to Ephesians. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you, he that is eight days old, so forth. Now, I rushed through it now, but next week we're going to see it. Here's the point. Circumcision is the cutting off of that foreskin of that young man's flesh, uh, if he's born. He could be a stranger born outside the land. All the adults who want to come be part of this covenant must have their foreskins, fled, uh, foreskins cut. Now, next week we're going to see why. Just understand what it is today. That it's cutting off the foreskin of the, the, the male organ, member, right? That's what he's talking about. We, we are adults here. Now go back to Ephesians 2. We're going to end there. Because I want you to understand that when he talks about the covenants, the Gentiles had no parts to this. You and me. Therefore, if you're not part of God's covenants, could God be your God? No. The answer is no. Because each of the covenants, he says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people, right? Now, that's why Paul says this. Now, again, we'll pick it up next week. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. We saw the, the enmity between David and Goliath. Verse 12. That at that time, previous to the dispensation of grace, Ye were without who? <clears throat> that means you can't go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and claim that was for you. We're going to see that next week. Thought I'd get to it today, but the Lord Jesus Christ would ignore Gentiles. That's right. You're without Christ. Why? Being, here's who you were, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Israel had a commonwealth. Shared the wealth. Communism. But a good one. And strangers from the covenants of what? Promise. Promise. Having no hope and without who in the world? Those covenants mean you have a hope and you have God to be your God. Now, can I end like this today? How God deals with us Gentiles today, yea, the whole entire world, Jew and Gentile alike, in the dispensation of grace from Paul on. There was a point in time when the entire world was hopeless. The only one who had hope were those little flock members. Their people, they fell. Paul was one of the fallen Israelites. No hope. Dead. Going to go to hell like a fire. All the Gentiles, dead in their sins and trespasses against God, like a fire. No hope. What the cross of Christ has allowed God to now do is pour out his marvelous, infinite grace. Through the gospel of grace, God says, I will give you hope of eternal life and inheritance and so forth as well. All the beautiful, wonderful things of his grace. But the main thing is you won't die in your sins. I'll give you forgiveness of sins. I'll give you righteousness. I'll give you eternal life. I'll give you an inheritance and your part in the inheritance you can play a part in by faith. The point is, that's what God is doing today. We didn't have God as our God, nor did we have any hope of glory. God didn't do it because of a covenant he made with us. 
God didn't do it because of any promises he made to us Gentiles. God did it based upon his own grace and love, pure grace. Covenant theologians and, and replacement theologians saying, well, you're Israel and all this. And No, no, no. That new covenant he made was with the house of Israel, house of Judah. It's not for us Gentiles. Right. Got to rightly divide. He's dealing with us with pure grace. And no, and no one is mentioning Ephesians because Ephesians is about the riches of his grace. Wait till we get to that passage. So we'll pick up that next time. I just want you to see that the issue of these covenants has to do with a hope of glory. Isn't that interesting? Colossians says, the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, you Gentiles, the one of glory, the hope of glory. Because there was a time where Gentiles had no hope of glory. What a marvelous thing. Fantastic. That's Colossians 1. Ephesians, Colossians. Go there. All right, we got in. If you're listening today, again, we're going to pick up next week. There's a lot more we need to see about circumcision and know why Paul brings it up in the first place in chapter 15. If you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? There's your hope of glory right there. Amen. I love you. These saints love you. That's why we have this ministry and put this out there. But more importantly, forget us. It's not about us. We're just the vessels. Who is it about? The Lord Jesus Christ. God loves you. And God sent Paul, old lowly apostle Paul, little Paul. Paul means little in stature. It's funny. Names describe people. He was called Paul because he was a little tiny little guy. Yeah, he was a Roman citizen, a little tiny guy. He, he grew up as Saul, named after the first king of Israel. That's his Hebrew name. That's who he was. But these Romans, they looked at him and said, look at that little guy. We call him Paul. Yeah, isn't that interesting? But what that actually represents when that name changed, he went from exalted big wig of Israel, Benjamite, Saul, to a little bitty Paul. You know, we little people in the lives of the world. Mm -hmm. That's where God wants you to be. Be small. He wasn't this short. No, he wasn't that short. <laughs> but my head, he's a big wig. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. God sent this little guy to tell this big entire world that God loves you and because of his, his, his grace of Calvary, pure grace, no covenants, no promises, just, hey, I want to be gracious. I'm going to give you eternal life by faith, no works. You don't even have to do this system of law keeping like my own people in past. If you just trust my son that he died on the cross to pay your sins and was buried and rose again, that cross work, but that, that, that propitiation took place. Believe on his blood, that's the point. It's life-giving blood. There's power in the blood of Christ to save. Just trust him. I'll give you eternal life. You don't have to move a, move a muscle, pray a prayer, go to church, give a tithe, repent. You know, which means, religious means to turn away from your sins. Water baptism, circumcised. You could be uncircumcised today. But can I tell you, we're going to see next week that Christ did something when you trusted him. He circumcised you. Not physically, but in your heart. We'll see that next week. Why don't you trust Christ today? Now, if you are saved, there's a life to live. None of us are here today because we didn't have something else to do. Well, maybe some people are. I got a sick wife at home right now. My heart's with her. My baby girl's at home. The children's room is in chaos because our, our girl's not there. Thank you all for dealing with that. I could have stayed home. I'd have had that right. Boy, boy, God said, hey, that's my wife. She's sick. I'm gonna take but you know why I'm here today? Because of you guys. I had, that, I had that choice, that right. Once my wife said, honey, you go, I said, thank you. Because some folks coming to hear the word of God, and she sacrificed an hour or two of sickness and not having me there and dealing with our four-year-old rambunctious girl. For you guys, she loves you all, and, she's, and I do too. That's why we're here today. You could have been somewhere else, but if you're here, it's because you love me and I love you and we love the saints and we're going to get this out. But more importantly, we have an assembly that's going to teach people this truth. Ryan comes from the trip that I made to Tahoe. He does that all the time. Hey, why does he do that? Because he loves the Lord. He's doing the work of faith, getting the doctor. The labor of love, the love of God toward me and you guys and others to get this out. So it's, and it's the same thing as Matthew. You guys do your prayers and attendance and giving. All that stuff is fruit abound to your account because you understand what God's doing. We can help some people.
My heart is sad because even amongst great circles, the importance of these truths. I was talking to Matthew from Southern Cal on Friday. And boy, these truths that we're sharing with people, even amongst grace brethren, we suffer because they reject it and us. Dispensationalists. We're doing something for the Lord. No, not about us, it's about the truth. But we're going to stand for it just like David. We'll help anyone who wants to be a part of that through this ministry, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can be a part of what you're doing in this, in this world today, Father. We know that this world is not our home. It's just temporary. It's a, it's a temporary place. We have these temporary tabernacles of these vile bodies to operate in. Keeps us weak so that you can have the, the glory, the power. But Father, we look forward to that day that as we minister today, your grace, we have that hope of glory, that future glory of reigning with Christ as joint heirs in the future. I pray that for myself, all these saints, and anyone who follows us with that heart of, of, of learning the truth. I pray it for all saints, but we know, unfortunately, most folks won't uh, believe these things the way they should. That's okay. We, we still love them. We pray for them. We all look forward to the day we can be uh, together with the Lord Jesus and Paul and, and the other saints of time past in the body. And then we can just get on serving you for eternity. Father, we thank you for this time together, and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.